one, I'll call this general community meeting to order. Uh, Council, before I start, uh, Councilor Gardner was uh, supposed to be in the chair. She, she is on Zoom, I believe. Is that correct, Mr. Clerk? Um, so uh, I'll be chairing uh, this evening, unless there are any objections. Seeing that. Uh, Councilor Gardner, did you just want to quickly? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Really appreciate you taking the chair, as you know, but Perhaps others don't. My daughter's waiting for a major surgery and I need to be very careful. So thank you for taking the chair for me. Absolutely. Uh, hopefully everything goes well and hopefully we see you back here. Well, we're waiting. We're waiting. We've been waiting for years. Okay, so thank you. I'd like to start by acknowledging that the land on which we live and work is the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe's peoples whose presence here continues to this day. Aurora is part of the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaty's First Nations. We acknowledge and thank them for sharing this land with us. A shared understanding of how the rich cultural heritage that has existed for centuries and of how our collective past brought us to where we are today will help us walk together into a better future. Council, can I get a motion to approve the agenda? Councilor Kim, Councilor Gilliland, any comments or questions on that? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? So that carries. Any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, we have no community presentations, no delegations. No consent agenda. We'll move right to advisory committee meeting minutes. We have two items on that. Uh, is there any questions on that or comments? Otherwise, I will ask for someone to move receipt of both those items, 7-1 and 7-2. Someone like to move that? Councilor Kim, seconder. Councilor Thompson, Mr. Clerk, uh, just before, can I get the screen on where so that way I can see? Thank you. Seeing no comments or questions on, on, those, on those items. I will call the vote. All those in favor? Oppose, that carries. Items requiring discussion, start with 8.1, Administrative Procedure Number 58, Insurance and Risk Management. We start with a presentation to be provided by Sarah Eve White, Junior Consultant in Risk Analysis, and Jack Gordon from Sigma Risk. Sarah, Jack. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm just going to give me one moment. I cannot seem to uh, start my video, but I will share the presentation. So I apologize for that. There we are. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Um, so my name is Sarah Eve White, and I will be presenting to you on behalf of Sigma Risk Management Inc. in Calgary, Alberta. We were hired by the town of Aurora to update its risk management policy and framework. To start off, I was asked to give you a quick overview on what risk management is. Uh, risk management is the process of identifying, evaluating, and assessing risks. When an organization knows which risks it faces, it can be better prepared for them. Um, so we do this by first identifying which risks are faced by an organization, in this case, the town, which is done through discussions with employees and use of industry data. We then assess those risks, 
by determining how likely they are to occur and their impact if they do occur. Um, we then prioritize which, which risks are outside of the town's risk tolerance and assign key risks. The key risks are the risks we need to worry about. So our sole purpose was to help the town upgrade its outdated risk management policies and framework. This new policy allows the town to focus on its risk management processes. The scope of work included 14 meetings with town staff, a review of the previous risk management policy, its current state, issues and recommendations for the new policy, provide an updated risk management policy, and finally this presentation to council. The processes we completed were establishing a risk tolerance framework, creating a risk management policy and framework, facilitated risk identification meetings, where town staff identified adverse events, facilitated the risk assessment, where staff assessed the likelihood and impact of an event, and prioritized risk based on our findings. Currently underway by the town is the risk mitigation planning and implementation for key risks. We will go into further detail of all of these processes. So risk tolerance is the willingness of the town to accept or reject a given level of residual risk, also known as the town's exposure to a risk. We broke the risk down into seven categories, uh, which include political risks, financial risks, people, culture, and social risks, process and system risk, insurable risks, reputational risks, and employee well-being and public safety risks. The risk tolerance will be defined as very low, low, moderate, and healthy for each of these categories. It is my understanding that council will be establishing the risk tolerance for each category sometime in the future. So the risk management policy and framework is 11 pages long. We do not have time to go into detail of this policy, but here is the table of contents. It has all of the elements of a normal risk management policy. The next few slides we'll go through are the process of risk management. So the first process of the risk management exercise was to determine which adverse events face the town. We did this through discussions with the town staff. 81 events were identified by the staff and these risks became the new risk register. The second step was to conduct a risk assessment. After identifying and compiling the risks, we had staff assess the risk register by assigning a likelihood and impact of each risk. We had three impact categories, financial impact, employee well-being or public safety impact, and reputational impact. The metrics we used are outlined in the table below. After compiling the assessments from staff, we developed a number of heat maps. We presented this in the, um, sorry, in the form of a heat map, which is a standard risk management practice. Um, this is a heat map from the results of the financial risk assessment. Uh, a heat map plops the likelihood and impact of a risk, the likelihood running along the x-axis and the impact running along the y. The red line represents the town's risk tolerance this risk tolerance line is provisional and was based off discussions with the CAO. Uh, the line will have to be adjusted in the future to reflect council's decision um, on the risk tolerance. Uh, the risks above the risk tolerance line are what we determined to be key risks. There are four events above this risk tolerance line. Um, these are the key risks. This heat this is the heat map of the results from the organizational risk assessment. Um, there are seven events above the risk tolerance line. Uh, there are 13 events identified as key risks. They are broken down into three categories, financial, organizational, and insurable risks. The key risks facing the town are underfunding of asset management, cost overrun or delay on the library pro extension project, pandemic, recession, blockage of storm pond resulting in flood, employee mental health deterioration, insufficient human resources, transgression by resident or other person, unplanned work arising from council decisions, 
liability for sanitary or storm sewer backup, windstorm damage, winter storm damage, and finally liability for third party bodily injury. All of these events require risk mitigation plans. Um, the town has assigned a risk owner for each event who is responsible for creating and implementing a risk mitigation plan. Again, this all follows standard risk management processes. And to conclude, there are five documents that need to be updated annually by the town. And that brings my presentation to an end. Um, thank you, Council. Thank you, Sarah. Council. The recommendation is that report number CS21-073 be received Two, that the risk management policy and enterprise risk management framework attached to this report be approved in principle. Would someone like to move that recommendation? Councilor Gilliland, seconded by Councilor Kim. Any comments or questions to the presentation or to the report? Councilor Thompson. Thank you. Uh, looking at a couple of those slides, Slides reminds me of the movie Dead Poet Society when uh, there's that scene where they're talking about uh, how to understand poetry and they talk about plotting it on a graph to measure its greatness. Um, and so I just uh, thought it was an interesting uh, way in which to look at it in terms of determining the impact and the likelihood and it just sort of triggered that scene. But in general, you know, I certainly believe that uh, it's, it's extremely important for the municipality to have um, a risk management policy and looking at ours, it, it is outdated. And so it's, it certainly is time to, to bring it into the 21st century, so to speak, and address and have a plan for the various risks. However, I'm not in support of the policy in front of us because I feel it's flawed and it must be flawed when one of the key risks within the organization is council decisions and or notices of motion. How can that be a key risk you look at all the things that municipalities face, cyber risk, we have a report next on service allocation and the Upper York sewage solution and running out of service allocation is not a key risk, but council decisions are. And council decisions are the will of the people, we're elected by the people. And so shouldn't the will of the people not be a key risk, but rather a reflection of the values of the organization. So how we came up with that must indicate a flaw in the process or system. And so that's where, for me, it starts with. But it's not just that. You know, you look at the mechanics within the policy and they talk about a two or three year horizon from a probability matrix. And I think you have to look longer than that for risks, especially when dealing with infrastructure and assets, you know. <laughs> I don't know about everybody else's experience, but sometimes things move at a glacial pace at the municipal level, and it takes a long time to get things done. Uh, case in point, it was almost four years ago that the Parks and Rec Committee and the council at the time said we needed a gym at the CERC, and we're still working towards that. Now, I could say that there is a risk to the community of not having enough gymnasium space, but it's taken longer than that two to three year horizon to get there. And so I think. Again, that's a flaw in the system itself. In addition, one of the other components they talk about is political risk. And yet out of the 40 some people involved in the development of this policy, not one sits at this table from a council perspective, not yourself, Mayor, or a member of council. And so who is determining the political risk as part of this process? Surely council needs to be involved in the development of this risk policy. So when I look at these, and I, I go back to the fact that, yeah, I, I support the development of the policy. But again, I look at those 13 key risks. And I think to myself, there are a slew that I think are much more significant that are missing. And so the process and the policy must be flawed. Because again, I'll go back to one of the key risks being work generated from council decisions. To me, that undermines the credibility of the process and the report in front of me. 
Thank you, Councillor. Any other comments or questions? Councillor Gartner, go ahead. You're on mute, Councillor. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, I couldn't unmute. Um, I spent a long time looking at this report and, and going over uh, all of the risks, the 60, well, I think there may be 80 risks here. And um, following on what Councillor Thompson said, um, a major power outage is number 60. It, it, fall, it falls at number 60 and it's rated as a two. From what I can see, the top rated risk was 7.35 or, so, or somewhere around there. To my mind, um, a major power outage would, should come much higher in the scale. And the other thing is with um, the flood risk, I can't remember what number it is, but that could be a huge risk, especially if the council holds liability for maybe not doing some work that we should have or and I, and I don't know if, I don't know if insurance would cover us in that case. So um, I, th I think it has merit. I think it has a lot of merit and I, I would like council to spend more time with this, um, but I'm not sure why we haven't to this point. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gallo. Thank you and um, <clears throat> As I was listening to the presentation, uh, I, I was also thinking to myself, you know, council should be a part of any major policy that's part of the town. And I looked at the list and, and none of us were. Um, I even thought to myself, you know, I would have made the time, even if it's just one of us to sit in some of those meetings and to provide a perspective from, from where, where we sit. So I, I share the concerns that Councilor Thompson has, and, and quite frankly, I should be, it should be across the board whenever we have serious, impactful um, policies that were developed and council should have uh, not only at the council table, but during the, the working, which is really nothing whenever you develop these types of things. I, I share that concern and, and I don't know what the timing is like, but I, 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 think, um, I think that has to be an integral part of, of this. Thank you. Councillor Kim. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, when I was reading the report, um, what I tend to do is kind of extrapolate before I read the whole report in terms of where the report is tracking and where the trajectory is, is going. Um, and uh, where I thought the report was going and where it ended up uh, did not align. And you know, at the end, when I talked about the, the 12 key risks, I was wondering whether this whole report was really about measuring those 12 key risks and nothing else, because uh, if that's the case, and I think, you know, it's a good start. I think there's, you know, a lot more that we need to go through to have a, a corporate wide risk management platform. And, um, no, things of, you know, if I can offer a suggestion, like what I was considering when I first uh, started reading the first couple of pages was that, you know, actions by council, actions by uh, staff, things uh, that we're considering like encroach encroachment agreements. Um, I thought there would be um, a risk management process where there would be a heat map where uh, encroachment agreements would have a certain rating or a risk premium attached to it so that it would help guide counsel in its decision. Because a lot of times, you know, whether it's, you know, I was thinking about insurable items like, you know, traffic issues, like, you know, speed, you know, whether to put in speed humps or um, stop signs, you know, all these things, you know, there, you know, we don't have any significant historical data to, you know, to back or support any decision council makes. So I thought where this risk management process was going was that there was going to be a risk rating or a risk premium attached to each decision that we make to help guide council. 
Um, that's not what it turned out to be. And, and certainly, I hope that that might be a suggestion uh, as we, you know, the 49 individuals get back into uh, the room and, and start contemplating more uh, robust uh, risk management process. And as was already indicated, I hope that, you know, we as council are integrated into the process. You know, I, it's been great the last 12 months that we've been, you know, we've had, uh, we've been scheduled, you know, 20 minutes, you know, Q and A period to a staff or with other uh, external consultants to ask our questions and be part of the process, whether it be cultural or otherwise. So it'd be, it'd be great to be a part of this as well, because this is pretty all encompassing when it comes to risk management. Um, So you know, other you know, I wouldn't say that they were key, key risk uh, items, but you know, you know, beyond encroachment agreements, I was thinking about you know, traffic, you know, staff operations activities, you know, uh, partnering with external organizations, whether it be from hiring of a contractor or partnering with not for profit, you know, you know, things like risk of not putting a fire station. You know, uh, and putting the response time at five minutes versus four minutes. Uh, development projects. Now, those are the kind of key risk factors or variables that I was hoping that this uh, risk management process would incorporate. And and so I hope that uh, you know some of the suggestions that we're already putting out there would be incorporated. And and I hope that uh, we have a uh, you know uh, more layers of us, including council, be uh, involved in this process. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Gilliland. Thank you. Um, I won't repeat everything that was said around the table, but I do uh, um, agree with a lot of the sentiment about the report. Um, I, I was a little uh, shocked about the top, uh, the top 13, especially in the organizational side. Um, just having some context around that, I think, would have been really helpful to understand how that was determined. Um, insufficient human resources, I think, we actually hired during the pandemic. So I'm just uh, curious as to how that became one of the top 10 um, key factors. Um, also, I, I think it would have been helpful if the list that was provided, because I know we have a heat map, but you're, you're kind of like, you know, paint by numbers, trying to, like, figure out which numbers which. And I think your organizational chart um, had a whole list of items that um, showed the risk, but they weren't in order of high to low. It was just kind of a risk. Maybe it was alphabetical. I don't know how in front of me, but I had to kind of like go back and forth and kind of figure out which one was which um, on your heat map. So that would have been kind of helpful for context to kind of understand where it actually um, stood on the map. Is there a way, I guess, through Mr. Mayor, to um, Sarah, that you know we could have a little more context provided with some of these top 13, and then maybe some sort of um, clarification of you know the top you know one to 80 in an order of likelihood to unlikelihood to help, to understand the context as well. Sarah. So uh, we do have a document that was provided to um, the town, uh, to Sarah Gill. She's been my main point of contact for most of this. Um, and that has all of the events identified by the town, um, as well as their likelihood and impact on all three categories. Um, and it's very maneuverable. Um, and I'm, I, I, I would have to speak to her, but I don't see that being an issue with having that reviewed by council. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I guess for more detail on how the top 10 risks and how the key risks were assigned and um, determined was through uh, town staff. Um, so when we had the discussions, when we had the risk identification meetings, it was um, a long discussion with every, Pretty, pretty much everyone. <laughs> um, and I listened and Jack, Jack and myself listened and um, heard concerns. Um, and we were able to come into uh, come to these 81 events. Uh, and from that point, we then had the same uh, staff assess the likelihood of these events 
um, as well as their perceived impact. So it's all, all of the information that um, the risks and events that were identified are coming from town staff. And I do want to mention, these are organizational risks. Um, so it, it would impact the function of the organization. So it would prohibit the town from functioning. And so the 13 key risks are the ones that um, aren't being mitigated at this moment um, or just need a mitigation plan so that if they were to occur, there was a process for um, continuing operations. Does, I hope that answers that, those questions. Um, Thank you, Sarah. Councillor? Thank you. Uh, it, it does provide a little context. Um, I think it's good to know how um, these questions and answers kind of came to be in order to determine what those key 13 action items are organizationally. Um, I definitely agree with Councillor Gartner about the stormwater pan management ponds and the risk of flooding, because definitely we've seen a lot more um, climate events that could mitigate how we would conduct town business if you know there was a power outage or flooding or something that would actually stop us from running and supporting the town. So I definitely can see that. Um, it seems to me that some of the top things that are key are um, again, not to repeat what Councillor Thompson said about you know work arising from council decisions, but that's what our job is to do is to make policy and change and move the town forward towards something progressive and and uh, the will of the people. And then on top of that, it's really focusing on the lack of human resources and the stresses, stresses that it's putting on staff in order, to, I guess, to, to perform those duties. So it's just trying to understand maybe having a circle up and understanding maybe with town staff where, where, where the context of this is coming from with council and working with staff and trying to understand that and how it puts it above, you know, 80 things organizationally you know, what is it that we can do to narrow down to actually make these changes? Because it's pretty significant to be top, you know, five, six, seven, eight out of 80. So I'm, I'm just, I'm just curious as to a little bit more information on that. That's just not provided within this report. Thanks. Thank you, Council. It seems uh, we're all in agreement, I think. And uh, uh, I think that maybe what would be uh, the best thing for us at this point is, is maybe if someone wanted to uh, refer this back to staff. Councillor Thompson, you want to move that? Councillor Gilliland, second. Councillor Thompson, did you want to say something? In addition to referring it back to staff, can we just add the, to, with regards to the comments around the table? Absolutely. I think, uh, to, to be honest, I think that uh, everyone's heard loud and clear what the comments were around the table, and I think that that will be taken into account. And uh, when this comes back, uh, I, I would also like to see maybe, as you mentioned, uh, some work with council as well as we work through this. So, uh, Mr. Mayor? Hello? Yes. Yeah, it's, John, Jack, go ahead. It's, it's Jack Gordon here. Oh, it's Jack. This is John on the screen. Sorry. Yeah, well, Jack is my uh, nickname. So I, I like John F. Kennedy. No, Jack. <clears throat> I, I don't know if you'd be interested in uh, a bit of a uh, reply. You know, I think uh, the counselors have uh, um, raised some good points. And, uh, you know, I, I'd be prepared to reply if you, if just to just a, a couple of them if you, if you had time. Well, I, I think at this point, I mean, we refer it back to staff. I mean, but uh, well, no, that that that's a, that's my point is that uh, this risk assessment came from staff, and uh, not not to the council, and that's typically the way it's done in a corporation. The staff does the uh, risk assessment, and the board of directors. Uh, uh, absolutely, yeah. Jack, and and I appreciate I appreciate you chiming in, but I got to be honest with you, um, we we don't debate with our with our present presenters. So therefore I'm gonna move forward with what council has put on the, on the floor and I will ask for a vote. Thank you though. All those in favor, opposed, that carries. Thank you very much. 8.2, servicing allocation update. Recommendation is that report number PDS 21-101 be received for information. Would someone like to move that? 
Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Kim. Any comments or questions on this one? Councillor Gardner? Oh, you're on mute, Councillor. If you could just give me a minute, if somebody else has a question, they could go first. Uh, sure, I will. Anyone Thank else you. have any comments or questions? Councillor Thompson, go ahead. Thank you. Since we're talking about risk, um, it's certainly <laughs> in the financial implications, certainly talk specifically about the potential financial risk of the town. But my question is through you to Mr. Waters. Mr. Waters, you say in the last uh, paragraph on page seven that uh, you identify a number of programs with regards to being able to extend out the service allocation. You say if all the developments in Aurora are enrolled in bonusing programs, allocation balances could grow by up to 20%, which would represent approximately an additional 10 to 12 months supply. I know it's hard to predict, but what is the likelihood of you know all or the vast majority of developments you know entering into these kind of programs, Mr. Waters? Through you, Mr. Mayor, it really depends on the um, applicant and whether they're willing to spend the additional money to implement uh, these uh, bonusing programs. Um, for instance, it would include the INI program, which I believe the town has participated in the past in the 2C area, which uh, was intended to free up some additional capacity by improving existing infrastructure. Um, there's also bonusing programs through the region as well, um, where um, they have a separate bucket, for lack of a better description, for allocation. And if you uh, provide affordable housing, for instance, or if you provide lead um, building improvements uh, through mm -hmm. the development, then you would be able to um, take advantage of that uh, capacity. Councillor? Thank you. And other than those programs, and obviously the, the obvious solution being the Upper York Sewage one, what other, uh, I guess, uh, mitigation plans are we talking about when, we, when we're looking at really only a three to four year horizon at this point in time? What else is out there that we should be considering, could be considering, or are considering? Mr. Waters? Through you, Mr. Mayor. That's a very good question, Councillor Thompson. Um, at this point, you know, we're all banking on the Upper York uh, sewage system um, solution uh, to provide the capacity needed for Aurora to grow um, in accordance with the region's uh, forecasts uh, for the town to 2051. Um, at this point in time, I'm not aware of any other alternatives to servicing other than what's described on page seven and what I've spoken to um, just now um, to, to provide for additional capacity once we sort of hit the wall. Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Walters. And, and yet this didn't make one of the key risks. <laughs> I did receive a letter from the Minister of Environment today in regards to this. I'll share it with, with council when I get an opportunity. Uh, Councillor Kim, and then I'll go to uh, Councillor Gart, back to Councillor Garner. Councillor Kim. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, to you to Mr. Waters, Mr. Waters, uh, so it seems like the province through Bill 306, mm -hmm. uh, through, you know, uh, to protect the environment, uh, they're putting, you know, uh, Bill 306 together and thereby uh, delaying the, the completion of the Upper York Sewage Solutions, which, you know, delays uh, development in all of York region, um, hence this report. Now, I recall last year, a couple of years ago, there was um, you know, GTA West corridor or the, high, the four, one of the 400 series highways that was planned to be built, but <gasps> the environment, um, the province wanted to go ahead with it without uh, environmental assessment. And then the you know, tier one municipalities, as well as the tier two municipalities, you know, we put forth uh, uh, our comments and, and um, and I rec strong recommendation that to go ahead with uh, with that, that 400 series highway, and so now I'm I'm seeing through this report that the province is becoming uh, more environmentally protective, and it seems kind of uh, inconsistent with past behavior. And I'm just wondering, uh, is there something beyond the obvious uh, from what you know, Mr. Waters, that's delaying this? Or um, and you also mentioned in, in a previous conversation about. Uh, that environmental uh, concern being 
if the uh, sewage solutions was established that there would be uh, a fear of having warm water going into uh, Lake Simcoe and harming the fisheries there for the indigenous people. Uh, is, is that the one reason or are there other environmental uh, concerns that the province had that's uh, preventing this project from uh, moving ahead? Mr. Waters? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I believe um, the um, outflow of warm water into um, Lake Simcoe um, is one of the concerns. Um, if you read the uh, letter that the mayor just referenced um, for um, reviewing the status of the Upper York system, one of the things they mention is that, you know, it's about 10 years old in terms of the, the work that's gone into the EA. And I think they want to look at a, uh, at a refresh of that work uh, because a lot of things have changed from a financial and environmental perspective that the work that was done leading up to the um, finalization of the EA study may be out of date. So I think that's one of the things they're going to look at from the advisory panel. But I don't, my only understanding is that the, the big issue was the outflow of warm water into Lake Simcoe. There may be others, but I'm not aware of those. Councillor, before I go back, just the, I can give you another one as well. There's an election coming up. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, and in the figures that you gave in the allotments, um, uh, we discussed this, but if you can confirm for everyone, so uh, Howard Johnson's and Shining Hill, have those allotments been included in the numbers that's on the in the report? Mr. Waters? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Shining Hill's phase two has been allocated um, units. Um, Shining Hills phase two has not, because it's not at the approval stage. Uh, for the uh, Howard Johnson's uh, renovation on Young Street uh, to a senior's facility, that is in the site plan process and has not been um, approved as my understanding. So an allocation has not been assigned to that development. Councillor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Gartner, then Councillor Gilliland. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just for clarification, a pumping station doesn't add more water into the system, does it? Or more capacity into the system? Mr. Waters? Um, through you, um, Mr. Mayor, the two um, pieces of infrastructure that um, are coming online um, will increase capacity slightly, um, which is referenced in the report uh, for about 300 units. Um, approximately to the three municipalities. Um, so yes, it does add some capacity and we're talking about the Henderson pumping station um, that the region is about to start construction on. And second of all, I believe it's upgrades to the St. John's pumping station on St. John's. I think that was pre-COVID if I recall the, the, um, the presentation. Uh, thank you, I, 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 didn't, I didn't think that pumping stations added capacity, so thank you. I've looked at the, uh, the last three reports. Perhaps you can help me. In, um, in, let me see, 2019, the end of 2019, it was estimated that there would be 2,100 units. And then in 2020, it was estimated there'd be 2,000. And then the one we had in, I believe it was, hold on, July said there would be 1900 units and we're three months later and we've gone down to 1400 units. I don't understand what would have, uh, I mean, it's a pretty fast consumption. Why would that be please? Mr. Waters? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, these numbers are quite fluid, um, pardon the pun. Um, uh, they, um, we work with the region. Um, the region uses a little different approach to, um, to allocation. What the town does is the town looks at allocation from a, um, at the draft plan approval stage or the site plan approval stage, whereby the region looks for more certainty uh, towards, the, um, towards the end of the planning process at registration or approval at site plan, which is why there is a differentiation in the numbers. Councilor? So, um... The numbers that we've had in all of these reports, are they from the region or are they from us? 
Mr. Waters? For you, Mr. Mayor, are there a combination of, of, of the two? Councilor? That doesn't help me. I mean, we should be comparing apples and apples for what's uh, happening in Aurora. And the, uh, to me, that should be what the numbers we should be getting in each of the reports. Um, and mixing them with the regions, it's just, I don't, I'm kind of speechless. <laughs> just be quiet for now. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Gallo, and then Councillor Gallo. Thank you. Um, I think uh, my question was answered. I was I was going to ask: Did the region not receive um, a new capacity assignment uh, update that indicated that we would be allocated? I think are we getting a thousand that's split between Aurora, East Gillenberry, and Newmarket? So is that three hundred and thirty-three each municipality, or is it a thousand each municipality for that Henderson pumping station? It's Councillor. It's three hundred. It's three hundred. Yeah. Okay, great. That was the clarity I wanted. Thanks. You're welcome, Councillor Gallo. Thank you, and thank you to Mr. Waters. Uh, in, in the conclusion, it speaks to um, weekly grant allocation on a first come, first serve basis. I'm just wondering, and I'm just really thinking out loud, but I'm wondering if, if that's part of the planning act or is it just something we, we normally do? It's common practice. Mr. Waters? For you, Mr. Mayor, it, it's the latter, Councillor Gallo. Um, where there are no servicing constraints, for instance, in my former municipality, you know, we didn't assign servicing. I mean, that was the region did that. Um, and there wasn't really a, a capacity issue, but in New York region, there is a capacity issue. And the process has been that the municipalities um, um, assign allocation because there's a, there's, there's a finite supply of it. Uh, sorry, maybe yet maybe I misspoke. My, my question is, do we have to, as a municipality, um, allocate on a first come first serve basis. Uh, can, can it be, you know, a council has a particular project that feels, you know, this needs to go ahead for whatever reason. Um, and we allocate that as opposed to something else. Mr. Waters. Three, Ms. Mayor. Um, that's a good question. Councillor Gallo. Um, that turns into a bit of a, a beauty contest um, at the end of the day. So if you're going to take, if council is going to take that approach, they need to have a criteria um, established whereby um, developments check off certain boxes, which then, you know, prioritize them uh, from a servicing allocation point of view. That's one of the things we're looking at through the OP review is coming up with um, a criteria uh, for allocation, given the fact that the, the, the current supply is, is running out and there really is on some uncertainty now as to what's the future of the Upper York uh, solution. Councilor? Thank you, and I, and I guess that's what I was gonna get to specifically with the, with the official plan, because you know, council might give direction that um, through various means that you know, downtown core is a priority for us. And if there's development in downtown core, it takes priority to something over by 404, that type of thing. If, if we have limited capacity, I think this council should, should should have that right to, to at least determine where our priority developments are, are going to be. Thank you, Councillor. Any other comments or questions? Councillor Thompson, second time. Thank you. Through to Mr. Waters, uh, just following up on Councillor Gallo's question. But in the past, reports have come to Council whereby we're the ones releasing the allocation to those certain developments. So I guess if council chose not to approve the release of those allocations to it, what then happens? Because in some ways, do we not control it in that sense because it is subject to our approval? Or is that something that ultimately could be appealed to uh, the land tribunal, formerly the OMB? Mr. Waters? Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, you're correct, Councilor Thompson. I believe you'd be setting the town up for an appeal if there wasn't some rationale as to why the servicing would not be um, released at, at a recommendation. So I, I think that's something that has to be considered. So therefore, to your, to your point, it's important to have that that you know matrix or, or uh, um, determinant before council would weigh into it, be able to justify any decisions. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gardner, second time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just go like to go back to my question from before to ensure we're 
comparing apples to apples. So we have four reports. Are we comparing them on the same criteria, all four? Mr. Waters? For you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would, uh, to you, Councillor Gardner, I would say that, yes, we are, if we're looking at uh, how the town determines servicing allocation or capacity versus how the region uh, uh, determines their um, allocation. So one of the things we're working at with the region is coming up with a standardized approach so that we don't have different numbers. We're, we're still working with the region on that. Councillor? So the numbers we've been given all along, is that based on Aurora's criteria, criteria or the regions, or did you say a mix? They should all be on the same criteria, whatever they are. Mr. Waters? For you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, the numbers that you've been seeing in the 19 reports um, and the 2020 reports are basically the staff uh, determination of available capacity. Um, we like to compare that with the region to see what their numbers are like, um, but they're as you, but they're for the most part they're pretty close to each other um, because as you know you move through the process you move towards registration or site plan approval so uh, that's where the region starts to sort of determine what allocation is available. Councilor, so can can I say that as of this report we have. 1,400 units left, that would be an agreement. We have that. I see Mr. Waters nodding his head, yes, yes. And then back to my other question. So what the, in the July report, was it Aurora determining that based on the same criteria as this report? Mr. Waters? Uh, three, Mr. Mayor, that is correct. So no. then back to, back to my other question. So. What's happened in the last three months that has uh, caused an, such an uptake in our capacity? It's gone from three and a half, it's gone from, well, five years to three and a half to four years. So what, what is the reason for that? Mr. Waters? For you, Mr. Mayor, we've had some developments we've allocated capacity for, uh, for instance, um, the Starlight proposal. Um, on Wellington, um, also the Metropolitan Square proposal, um, and also uh, Mavernac, uh, Mavernac proposal at Wellington and Mavernac. So those are, those proposals were brought, presented to you and a re recommendation for allocation. Councillor? Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Oh, okay, sorry. I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. Next we have 8.3, 2022 fees and charges reaffirmation. Recommendation is one, that report number FIN 21-038 be received. Two, that a bylaw be enacted to set 2022 fees and charges for the applications, permits, use of town property, the sale of documents, and for the prescribed service charges for administrative matters as itemized on the attached schedules. Would someone like to move the recommendation? Councilor Thompson, Councilor Kim, any comments or questions on this one? Councilor Gardner, go ahead. Um, could I ask what uh, inflation rate we're using here? Ms. Wayne Wright, Van Kessel. For you, Mr. Mayor, the inflation rate that's being used here is 2%. Councilor? Thank you. And the actual inflation rate now and predicted, or first, the actual rate now is quite a bit higher than that, isn't it? Ms. Wayne Van Kessel? Through you, Mr. Mayor, the inflation rate for Toronto at the end of August was 3.3%. For Ontario, it was higher at 4%. Uh, Toronto area was a little less because the shelter costs were already fairly high to begin with. Councillor? 
Um, so why wouldn't we be going with a higher rate than two? Ms. Wainwright Castle. Through you, Mr. Mayor, there was also a 2% inflation that was added last year in the budget. So, or through this report, these fees. So overall, we had uh, lower uh, inflation last year and higher this year. So on, on average, it evens out fairly well. I'm sorry, we were calculating it at, um, we were calculating 1% higher than it actually was, Ms. or what we thought it was going to be. Ms. Wayne Ryan Van Kessel? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So last year, the actual inflation rate actually ended up being lower than 2%. So when we look over the two year span, 2% over the two years should be reasonable. Counselor? Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm asking because the, the whole point is so that, I mean, not that I want to charge our residents more money, but so that we cover, it's we protect the corporation. So if you feel that's fine. Um, on Schedule B, page three, sorry, it's about signs. I don't have it in front of me. Does anyone on staff know what I'm talking about? Schedule B, page three. I think Ms. McDougall. What is it, Mr. Clark? Planning and development, Mr. Waters. Sorry, Ms. McDougall. I thought it was still on yours. Councilor, can you say the page again? So, Mr. Waters. Uh, it's it's Schedule B. Yep. And it's page three. And it's right at the top. It's um, signed bylaw review of applications other than a signed permit application, including signed bylaw review of planning applications. I just like a translation, or at least something I can understand. Yeah, and that might be Ms. Van Leeuwen. So, Ms. Van Leeuwen or Mr. <laughs> Waters, who wants to answer that? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I have found it. Um, I, I would have to get back to the council on that. I don't want to give an incorrect answer. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, there's also, uh, I don't know why exactly it's under legal services, but uh, talking about minor site plans in the stable neighborhood, it says minor site plans, stable neighborhood. Um, that costs $227 in fees. And in other areas, a minor site plan costs $725. Mr. Waters? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I will... <clears throat> Let Patricia DeSera uh, speak to the uh, lower cost, but I believe the $700 fee is the actual processing fee for a stable neighborhood site plan. Um, and I believe the lower fee may be to register it. Ms. DeSera. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the, so the stable neighborhood fee is they're mainly residents who apply for these. So we are just charging them the amount of um, almost like our, our title search costs and some of the other expenses that we have. Whereas the other minor site plan are in other areas that are not just stable neighborhoods. And those are typically more uh, corporate businesses or developers. And so we're charging them a higher fee. I spoke, I spoke to this some months ago when I first saw this. And um, it says, first of all, and you could certainly check your records, most of the new homes, the very large homes in the stable neighborhoods, they are non-resident homes. And it says anyway on this chart, it says non-resident homes. We're charging non-resident developers $227 fee in the stable neighborhoods 
And in other areas, we're charging non-resident developers $725. And when I spoke to it at the time, some months ago, there was going to be no charge for um, the fees because of what you just said, that it's mostly residents. But in fact, and it's very easy to check, it's very high percent of non-residents. It's developers who buy a residence home that is small and they put up a much larger house on that lot. So their fees should be just the same as fees in any other part of the town. So I actually, um, I find it very disrespectful that there would be a different charge in the stable neighborhoods. One of our vulnerable neighborhoods for very large homes, I think that if someone wants to, to build a house there, they have to pay just as much in fees as anyone else. I'd like an answer, please. And if you don't want to give it to me now, I'll wait. Ms. Mr. Waters or Ms. Tessera, whoever wants to. Mr. Waters. Through, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, I recall the conversation at council uh, uh, and I believe what we decided upon was there would be additional charge for non-owner occupied stable neighborhood applications. I do recall right. that. Yes. Um, my understanding is <clears throat> that that was implemented as part of um, the uh, last uh, fees and bylaws update. Um, but um, perhaps, uh, perhaps I should, I'll look into that for you and, and respond Thank you. if I can give you an accurate answer. I would appreciate that. I don't remember it being updated. I think this is the only update we've had, but um, thank you. And the fee should be the same. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, there's one more. Um, could somebody tell me uh, where in town you pay $11 for a parking permit and where in town you pay $371 for a parking permit? This is... Um, uh, page six. Miss Van Loon. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, it would depend on the length of time and the parking permit status. So we permit uh, spots at town park and at town hall for periods of one uh, one week, one month, three months, six months. So it depends on that. And then last year we implemented the just-in-time parking permit system for those occasions during the winter where you might have a guest over and they need that one-time parking permit. But it's not permitted during a snow event. But for uh, other uh, evenings uh, overnight, uh, if there's no snow event, they can purchase that one night overnight parking permit. Follow up, Mr. Mr. Mayor. So it depends on um, duration, duration as opposed to location. Correct. Mr. Thank you. And um, we delayed that uh, just in time parking uh, because of the pandemic. We were it was very poor optics. We didn't want. I mean, people weren't supposed to be visiting. Um, so it was delayed for a time. Do you know when it started? Ms. Van Leeuwen? Through you, Mr. Mayor, we uh, implemented a new parking management system in the fall of last year, and we implemented the just-in-time parking permit system, which is part of that parking management system, in January of this year. Councillor? Uh, Thank you. I thought we delayed it because of, I mean, the restrictions were very tight because of the pandemic in January. I thought we had delayed that longer. Thank you, Ms. Van Leeuwen. Uh, last question uh, to three, Mr. Mayor, I guess to Mr. Durand, or I'm not sure who. It's about the freedom of information. Um, $30 an hour, is that the standard rate for the most municipalities, or is that high? Sure. Hey, Mr. Mayor, and through you, uh, that is a provincial rate that is set by the province through the Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Council. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, that's all. Thank you, Councillor. 
Councillor Thompson and then Councillor Gallo. Thank you. We had three to Ms. McDougall. Ms. McDougall, in your report in Schedule D, Community Services, you talk about the rental of town facilities um, uh, has been expanded, and so staff are now recommending that the individual room rates be removed from the bylaw schedule and replaced with a, a room rental range. range. But at the end of that paragraph, you also state that a detailed list of room rental rates will still be maintained and posted to the website by community services. So I just want to make sure I, I understand, because I looked at the schedule, and uh, certainly when it comes to facility rentals, I see that uh, you've crossed out you know, community center and the armory and so forth, and I have a line for meeting room rental of between free and 250. So I guess... Perhaps you can just uh, further explain what you meant by also having a list of rates posted at the community services website. Ms. Pickable. Thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, similar to what we do for our recreation programs, where we have a guide that comes out every season, uh, which uh, promotes and advertises our uh, dedicated rates for those particular programs, we would be monitoring and managing rental rates on a similar basis, but they would be published on our website um, so that anyone interested in our sites, in particular rim rental, uh, what they're some of the rims will have extra charges um, depending on what the need of the room is. Um, but ultimately we're trying to narrow in um, and be more flexible with what the rental rates are. So we are planning to still promote it. It's just the bylaw would enable us that flexibility to adjust or, or adapt a little more readily depending on the needs in the community. Council. Thank you. And just as a follow-up. So does that mean that the rates for those particular rooms could change from season to season? And if so, I'm sure there must be groups that uh, rent the room throughout the course of the year. Would they get a fixed rate or would they also be subject to that sort of floating policy? Mr. McDougall? Mr. Mayor, uh, we would see these as an annual rate. Uh, we would follow along with the uh, any inflation rates that are applied to the fees bylaw. So once they're established at the beginning of the year, they'd be that way for the that calendar year. Thank you. Councillor Gallo. Thank you. And one of my questions were, was answered. Um, the, other one just, the, the last column on all of the schedules says 2022 changes to approved fees. I, I would assume that that column would show the increase in the various line items. Uh, unless I'm reading it wrong, it, it doesn't show that. Sorry, Councillor, I didn't, I didn't get that last part. Unless I'm, I'm reading it incorrectly, shouldn't that last column on all the schedules show the difference, the increase from 2021 to 2022? Thank you. Ms. Wainwright Van Kessel? For you, Mr. Mayor, it doesn't show the difference. It shows the, the new fee in 2022. So with the multi-year budget, we had some fees that were approved for multiple years. So this shows as if it changed um, for 2022 compared to last year's. Councillor? Okay, is, is it, I mean, short of going line by line through everyone, is it difficult to add a column there to show what the increase is? I mean, ultimately that's something that, that will go on uh, other than going line by line. I swear I have a through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, we can work through the clerk's office to add a, a column showing the difference. Thank you. Councilor. Sorry, Councilor, is that all? Oh, okay, sorry, didn't see. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none. Call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. 8.4, 2022 Council and Committee Meeting Schedule Recommendation that report number CS21-072 be received. Two, that the 2022 Meeting Schedule Attachment number one be approved. And three, that the town clerk be authorized to make amendments to the council and committee meeting schedule as required. Would someone like to move the recommendation? Councilor Gilliland, Councilor Thompson, any comments or questions on this item? Seeing none, 
Oh, Councillor Gardner, go ahead. Uh, so it's kind of a difficult question, Mr. Mayor. Um, so every year I go through and I see where the Jewish high holidays, well, they're really high holy days, but high holidays land. And sometimes they land on meetings and sometimes they don't. This year, nothing landed on a council meeting, but on so many others. Um, so if what would happen if a council meeting landed on a high holy day? There's only, there would only be two days that that could be possible. It, it's, just a, it's just a question. <laughs> I mean, I didn't check the calendar because it seems pointless, but <laughs> would it make any difference? Mr. Clark. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, we would certainly, um, you know, do our best not to do that. If it did land on that, we, uh, I guess it would depend on the day, the meeting, um, it would certainly be in council's, uh, purview to make an amendment to move it off that day. So I guess it would depend on, um, the day and of course the meeting. Council. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think that would make things very difficult, uh, for the council schedule, but thanks anyway. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Call the vote. All, all those in favor? Opposed? That carries. Next, 8.5, request to remove 103 Garnett Street from the Aurora Register of Properties of Cultural Heritage Value or Interest. Recommendation one, that report number PDS 21-102 be received. Two, that the request to remove 103 Garnett Street from the Aurora Register of Properties of Cultural Heritage Value or Interest be approved. Would someone like to move the recommendation? Councillor Gilliland, Councillor Kim, comments or questions on this item? Seeing none, I will call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. Next, 8.6, Heritage Permit Application, file HPA 2021-08 for 124 Wellington Street East. Recommendation, one, that report number PDS 21-103 be received. Two, that the Heritage Permit Application, HPA 2021-08 be approved to permit the replacement of the existing windows, proposed new window openings, and proposed exterior signage for the existing building at 124 Wellington Street East. Someone like to move the recommendation. Councillor Thompson, thank you. Seconded by Councillor Gilliland. Any comments or questions on this item? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed, that carries. Next, 8.7, Heritage Permit Application File HPA 2021-09 for 80 George Street. The recommendation is that report number PDS 21-106 be received. Two, that the Heritage Permit Application HPA 2021-09 be approved to replace the stucco and gables on the existing dwelling at 80 George Street. Would someone like to move the recommendation? Councillor Gilliland, seconded by Councillor Thompson. Any comments or questions on this one? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. No notice of motion. Regional report. Someone like to move to receive that for information? Councillor Gilliland, thank you. Second. Councillor Gardner, thank you. Any comments or questions on the regional report? Councillor Gilliland. Thank you. I just have to get back to the report, so we skipped ahead. It's just a, a comment that I was really happy to see that the York Region acquired 142 acres of uh, hectares of land to expand the York Regional Forest, so I was really glad to see that that investment was made. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments, questions on the Regional Report? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed, that carries. New business. Councilor Gilliland, start to my right. Nope. Councilor Kim. Nope. Councilor Thompson. Nope. Councilor Gallo. 
Oh, Councilor Gardner, new business. Oh, all right. Public service announcements. Go the other way, Councilor Gardner. Public service announcement. Thank you. Um, not exactly a public service announcement, but I think it's worth noting. Um, Maple Tea Room in the Longos Plaza has closed. It's uh, such a shame they won best business of the year. Oh, I guess it's three years ago now. Um, sorry to see them go. Um, something I missed during the summer, so if you'll permit me, <clears throat> It was National Day of the Monarch Butterfly. We're gonna have a butterfly park. And um, they have the longest migration of any insect in the world, 4,300 kilometers to Mexico. And it was also the National Day of Seniors last week. And of course, um, we're all still thinking about that very excellent um, day we had at the Cham Park, the cultural center in the town, presenting the first national day of uh, reconciliation. That's all, Mr. Mayor. That's all. Th thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Gallo, public service announcement. Councilor Thompson, public service announcement. No, Councilor Kim, public service announcement. Councilor Gillian, PSA. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to point out that this Thursday is the uh, Colors of Fall concert in Town Park. It'll probably be the last event that we'll be holding until um, maybe February with the family day thing. Uh, so that's Thursday, October 7th from 6.30 to 8.30 at Town Park, the American Roads. That would be great if you brought a chair and a little blanket because it could be a little chilly, um, but hopefully I'll see you there. Is that all, Councilor? Yes. Thank you. Um, I have a few. Have fun over Thanksgiving holidays. Aurora has programs and activities for everyone to enjoy. For more information and full details, please visit aurora.ca slash holiday schedules. Until October 24th, the town of Aurora is actively collaborating with local cultural organizations to highlight Aurora's arts, culture, and heritage scene for culture days. For more information, visit aurora.ca slash culture days. Be entertained through family-friendly greenhouses. Another, if you want a good scare, plus a fang. Uh, who writes this stuff? <laughs> so, evening trail of spooky huts at Aurora's 2021 Haunted Greenhouse on October 23rd and 27 to 30. For more information on our Haunted Greenhouse, please visit aurora.ca slash haunted greenhouse. Our fall 2021 program guide has arrived including both in-person and virtual programs for all ages. The guide can be viewed online at aurora.ca slash rec guide. Pre-registration is required for all programs and drop-in activities at aurora.ca slash ePlay. Club Aurora Fitness Center is now open. Pre-registration is required. Full de details available online at aurora.ca slash club aurora. Check out our fitness programs and classes online at aurora.ca slash fitness. And a free program providing community outreach to seniors and adults via telephone and Zoom. You can check it out at the Senior Center Without Walls monthly schedule online at aurora.ca slash SCWW. And I just wanted to finish up with today. It, we do recognize World Teachers Day. And um, I think that we're all very thankful for everything that teachers do for our community from educating our future leaders, as well as keeping them safe throughout the pandemic. So thank you to all the teachers out there. With that, Council, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. Councilor Kim, Councilor Gilliland. All those in favor?